The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 669 for Sunday, August 6th, 2017. Good readings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where you send in tips, questions, cool stuff found, and we share the answers, share the tips, share everything, because the goal is... That all of us, each and every single one of us, you, me, him, her, that one, yes, all of us learn at least four new things each and every time we get together. One of the new things that I'm going to teach you is about our sponsor, Smile, Text Expander from Smile. You can get free for 30 days if you go to textexpander.com slash geek. We'll talk more about that later in the episode here. Here, back in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here... Still in Fairfield, Connecticut. John F. Braun. How you doing today, Mr. F. Braun? Yeah. Hey. Yeah. All right. Good. I'm glad. All right. Let's go to Todd. Then uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll figure out the rest of this later. It's gorgeous weather here, though. Um, it's, I have my window open. We'll see if that can remain. But uh, for now, it seems loud. Todd asks, he says, I use text edit very often, but lately it's been crashing on me. Ironically, when it happens, it's only when I hit command S to save a file. I get the beach ball and I must force quit where it shows the app is not responding. Very frustrating, as you can imagine, to lose my notes by trying to save them. I like text edit because it's lightweight, fast and simple. Uh, it has rich text formatting for bold links, font sizes, images, URLs, etc., and it uses normal RTF or TXT files in the finder so I can organize, make aliases, etc. Unlike Evernote or Apple's Notes app where I have to live inside of their organizational structure. He asks if you know of another, if we know of another good uh, app that fits these requirements. And I'm sure we could come up with one, but there's no reason to punt on text edit. It should not be crashing. No app should be crashing on you like this, especially not one that comes with the OS. So let's... um. Let's let's talk about this. And ironically, uh, in the pre-show today, I was talking about how iTunes on my Mac, either on this particular Mac, is either launching slowly or quitting slow and quitting slowly and won't let me download files. Um, I had to stream some some songs earlier instead of downloading them and playing them locally. It's similar problem in my mind, like that, that's happening here. So um I would say, and I'm not going to do this for myself right now because we're recording a show, John, but but these are these are sort of the steps that that actually I was just sort of musing on uh, doing locally here. Um, the first thing to do is either boot in safe mode or run Onyx um, in automation mode. Now, I don't always run uh, booting in safe mode will clean out a lot of cache files. It'll run a lot of the maintenance and, and, and the, it'll do a lot of the same things that Onyx will. Onyx will do a little bit more. And some of the things that Onyx will do uh, or let you do is uh, delete saved application states and automatically also delete the automatically saved versions of documents. Uh, I generally leave those off because I don't want to mess with my saved application states. But perhaps in this scenario, especially the one that Todd's describing, that might not be a bad thing to do. Just be aware that if you've got other apps like pages or numbers where you've got documents that are just in a state of flux that you sort of rely on that. You'll also be deleting those. But when I run Onyx, uh, when I go to automation mode, um, I use slightly different settings than the default. So if you want to use the same settings as me, click reset defaults or restore defaults there. And then, uh, Oh, where's my, I have, I have to make sure I get my notes. And then the ones that I change are I enable repair permissions and spotlight index. So it's going to repair permissions and delete the spotlight index. I disable the Onyx cleaning of my web browser, browser cache and history um, because I don't necessarily want to lose my web browsing history every time I need to run Onyx. So those are the three things that I change from the defaults there in the automation tab of Onyx. But otherwise, I just run it straight. So repair permissions and spotlight index enabled web browser cache and history disabled or unchecked that's what i do 
So I, I think, and, and again, like I said, for this particular scenario, I would also try in Onyx enabling uh, the cleaning of saved application states and automatically save versions of documents, because it's possible that's getting in the way here, that when you go to save, it's trying to read one of the automatically saved things so that it can incorporate those changes and maybe that file's damaged or who knows what, and then boom, there you go. Any thoughts, my friend? It's a cache somewhere. It's always a cache. Right. Right. I agree with you. That, yeah. It's, well, it's a cache or, I mean, I, I guess it could be a preference file, but this seems like I, I'm, I'm more with you that it's, it's a cache or, you know, like you said, one of those saved application things, which is also a cache of its own sort. Right. As far as we know. Well, that's the idea is telling you as far as we know. And then the conversation continues. You know, for now, the conversation continues over on Facebook at MacGeekUp.com slash Facebook. But Adam and I have been cooking up a little something internally at, uh, at, at MGG TMO Central there. And, and there might be a change to that. So I'll, I'll keep you posted. There might be something for us to try, perhaps a better system. But, uh, but we'll keep you posted on that. For now, MacGeekUp.com slash Facebook is a great place to, uh, to hang out during the week when we're not right here. Todd, I believe it's the same Todd. I didn't realize this when I put it together, but Todd also has a question about the Mac OS firewall. And Todd asks, and because he's a premium listener, we'll let him have a twofer here in the same show. He says, I'm confused about the sharing and firewall system preference panes on my Mac. My firewall is set to block all incoming connections, but the sharing pane says other users can access shared folders on this computer. So which is it? Do these pref panes not communicate with each other? Or is this just weak and confusing messaging by Apple? So what Todd's talking about here is if you go into system preferences and you go into uh, security and privacy uh, and go to the firewall, if you turn the firewall on, um, you will see firewall options. And one of those in that options tab, you can configure all sorts of specific firewall related things. However, one of them right at the top of that tab says block all incoming connections. And right below where it says block all incoming connections, it says just what Todd says, block all incoming connections, except those required for basic Internet services such as DHCP, Bonjour and IPsec. So it will block all of the things where it's supposed to block all of those things that um, that like file sharing and iTunes sharing and all of that. So that it's an easy place to just block that stuff when, say, you're traveling or in a coffee shop and you don't want people to have local access to your Mac. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. Though, per, the way that I set it up typically, I do not have block all incoming connections checked. No, I, I think that's meant to be used as a temporary stopgap when you're if, when you have sort of all your setup and you, you do want, in most cases, file sharing on and iTunes sharing and photo sharing on and those sorts of things. But then you get to a scenario like like I said, a hotel or somewhere public where you want to just block that. This is a one checkbox place where you can block that. And then also a one checkbox place where you can unblock it. And then everything that you had previously configured to let through is being let through. Right. And the other one, um, especially in an enterprise environment, I would say you do not want to check is this stealth mode because a lot of enterprise management tools count on being able to detect your machine being there. To ping your machine and know that it's there. Yeah. Oh, that's good to so know. If, yeah. if you uncheck that, uh, your sysadmin may shake their fist at you and got it and say don't do that please yeah, yeah please it right. my job more difficult yep yeah. but i agree this dialogue can be a, a bit confusing well especially because once it's enabled the sharing preference pane doesn't reflect that change uh so that that's the that's the confusing part and i, and I totally get that todd now i I like that Apple has this here because it is nice to have just that one stop shop of checking that box and you're good to go. And it's really nice to have it built into the OS. What's even nicer, though, if it's automatic. And for that, I actually use a piece of software called Little Snitch. Um, now, Little Snitch is not it, not mainly built to do this. It's mainly built to let you 
manage all of the incoming and outgoing connections of your Mac all the time. I find that to be a little obsessive and and um, and frankly annoying. So I have three profiles set up with little snitch. And one of them is for when I am either at home or at a you know trusted friend or family member's house. And it will automatically set that profile knowing my wife, the Wi-Fi network that it's on from, uh, you know, and this is on my MacBook Air. And when it's on a trusted Wi-Fi network, it lets everything through and it never asks me about anything. So it's as though it's not there. Then when I travel, I have a travel profile that blocks all of the stuff we just talked about. And, you know, let only lets through the things I want to let through. And then the third profile I have, and I've talked about this before, is my tethering profile that blocks anything, any background activity. So it won't let Dropbox sync. It won't let iCloud drive or photo sync or any of that stuff. It'll only let apps that I've manually launched run. And that's pretty handy. And it takes a little bit of effort to set this stuff up with little snitch, but, uh, but it's not terrible and it's totally worth it once you've kind of got it straightened out. And then, and then it's automatic. And then that way, whenever I join a new Wi-Fi network, little snitch pops up and says, Hey, which profile do you want to use on this network? And I can say, Oh, great. Use travel normal and I'm good to go. And then it, and then, you know, anytime I'm at a Hilton hotel and I join the H honors network, it just knows. Okay, great. And I, and it sets up a little alert. So it's telling me what it's doing, but it's handy stuff. Either way. Now, you do it. Yeah. Dave, John, you may ask yourself, not how do I work this though? Sometimes we all ask ourselves this. <clears throat> Thank you. Talking heads. But um, yes. <laughs> what if you want to see what your, what your machine looks like to other devices on the network? How do you, how do you even determine this? And I'm going to toss out oh, I like it. three, cool. th- not one, not two, but three. So we've almost approached four, but um, here are some tools that I use when I'm on, uh, especially on a guest network, just to, just to have fun. Um, one is called flame. Okay. And I think you've used it too. So yep. it's this is a Bonjour or zero conf browser. The end result is if you run this, and there is both a, a Mac and a uh, iOS yep. version of it, it'll basically show you all of the machines that are on your local network segment and what services they're advertising that they offer. So that might like be it. handy. Uh, another one that, that I think you and I both use is Fing. Yep. So we uh, got Flame and we've got Fing. And then the third one, and this is more advanced geekery here. You probably want to install this using a, um, a package manager, like a home slash, I mean, homebrew. <laughs> um, but it's called Nmap. It's a very uh, mature tool that can do very detailed profiling of a specific device. Um and it's a command line. I There may be a, a GUI version, but okay. it's something you run from the command line and you basically target an IP address and say, all right, you know, tell, tell me what's up. Um, higher learning. The, the others are, are pretty straightforward as, as far as what they do and uh, letting you dig deeper. NMAP, you, you, you're you going to have to read the man page to kind of figure out okay. uh, yeah. what's happening. But yeah, I've yeah, used yeah. that in the past as well. But I'd say the first two there um, are good to see not only what other machines, but also what your machine is advertising. You can, you can scan your own machine, of course. So, so I'm trying to remember, um, what that app is. God, I want to say like, like, uh, it, it, it's a, it sits, it's, I mean, it's a background app, but it has a little menu bar icon and it does sort of the same thing that I'm talking about doing with little snitch where it blocks stuff. Um, Jeff Gamet's written about it, and I, I never remember. It's like pack away or trip, trip, trip mode, trip mode. That's it. So trip mode is the other one, I think. And I think it's at like trip mode ch. Oh yeah, it is. <laughs> you go girl. You know that's Boy. like when I'm on stage and I can't remember the lyrics to the second verse of the song, and I just I start singing. No, no, no. It most of the time, like your brain <laughs> knows this stuff, right? But you can get in your own way, just like I was there. I was like frustrated the whole time you were talking instead of like always listening to you. I was half listening to you and and I should have just listened to you and let myself relax. Because then when I started talking, it was like, oh, I know what I know the answer. Of course. Yeah. So trip mode is the other one. I've never tried trip mode, but um, but from those that have, I hear that it does similar things so that, you know, when you can choose what's going to have access to your your network and, and stuff like that. Yeah, I should give that. A, I'm, I'm, I'm going to. Try to give that a spin. Yeah, there you go. 
Yeah. And you have a little snitch, right? So you, I mean, you could set up profiles too. Yeah, I could. I, 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 I've always said that little snitch has, there is, they, they have a thus far squandered opportunity to really like, you know, exist in, in that space. But you know, Hey, they do their own thing. So it's fine. And I'm still on the version three. I'm oh, you haven't moved to version four. four? Oh, version four is really nice. It It's way easier to, um, to kind of move around and get stuff, you know, into place and all that good stuff. So. Yeah, I like it. And it's got a, 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 you know, like a GPS or not GPS, but but location based map where you can see where all the connections are going to and from for your computer, which is pretty cool. I think. So there you go. Yeah. Good stuff, John. Always. Almost always. Almost always. Um, all right. We have we have three things that I think are going to fall into the geek challenge realm. We might be able to get them answered during this episode, but, uh, but I think the, they might fall into geek challenges. So we, we uh, easy for me to say, we will start with Nectario and Nectario asks, as long as you can find it here, I, I frequently engage my computer in processes that take hours after effects, renders copies of large raw footage collections, etc. I would love to have a screensaver that will show a floating window with a progress bar for the active process in which the machine is engaged. That way I could let the monitors rest during the process. I tried putting the monitors to sleep, but if I have several consecutive steps or processes, I have to keep guessing and waking up the monitors to check if it is time to move on to the next step. I think the screen, a screensaver like I described could make the whole thing a lot easier. Any recommendations? So I guess what I'm, I don't have a off the top of my head recommendation, but I, the way I can think of, you know, if I put on my, my programmer hat, or at least my hat now that, that I'm mean, actually, I do quite a bit of programming these days, but, but a lot of times what I do is I put on my, you know, engineering hat and say, okay, here's how I would go about solving this problem. And then perhaps ask somebody else to write the code. Um, and with the, with either of those hats on John, the, the thing I'm thinking about is th there's no way for one screensaver to just know what your machine is doing and, and magically intuit that which you would like surfaced on the screen. Um, but if your app has a progress window, uh, my thought is you bring that window to the forefront, like you make that the the focused window and then you let it go into screensaver mode and you have some screensaver that says, OK, look, take whatever the active window is. Keep refreshing it, but keep moving it around the screen so that, you know, it avoids any burn in or anything like that, that someone might be worried about. Right. I mean, I, I can't think of another way to to go about solving that. I'm sure there is another way. It's just not one that comes to mind. What do you think? I think figuring out how long something will take is hard. <laughs> well, no, that's that's not at all what he's asking. He's asking to have the progress bar shown to him when the screensaver is on the screen. That's it. No, oh, I know. That's it. I'm, I'm just musing. Okay. All right. Well, a tangent. So any thoughts about how, it, like anything you know of that exists for this or somebody that's done something like that? I'm going to take that as a no. No, I mean, you know, the app itself knows, but, you know, how, how does the app itself, how can you get the app to, to tell you right, this? Right, to communicate That's... that. Yeah. Yeah, even better would be to have something that actually sleeps the screen so that you're not using power. Because a screen saver really doesn't turn the screen off. So you're not really saving power with a screen saver. What you want is the screen to actually be put into power saver mode. And then have, say, an alert on your watch or your phone when the the activity completes. And I suppose that also is possible, but not necessarily. Uh, um, you probably need to build some hooks into the specific apps to do that, maybe. Unless they, they a rang a bell when it went off. Now that I think about it. Yes. Hmm. Yep. A, a, a thought's coming here. So. Okay. I mean, there are certain tasks that you can automate with uh, Automator. Sure. I mean, it, it, okay. Now this is good. Now, now uh, I just had some more coffee, so good. Okay. <laughs> the wheels are turning. He's but, back. Um, but um, 
a lot uh, many apps will expose certain actions yes. to uh, automator and allow you to automate them so right. and suppose, you can have automator do something when an app is is when a certain task is finished too correct so you uh. could well that's a, as soon as you said bring a bell or something like that i mean that's something that's trivial for an automator script to do sure uh, yeah of course so i mean if if the app itself um exposes certain functions to automator you could write an automator script to say okay you know start doing this uh, you know, whether it be, you know, a graphic transform. Yeah, whatever it is. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think like graphic converter, for example, exposes a lot of things. Um, yeah. It sounds like so, some, yeah. so, I don't know if after effect does. That's the thing. Right. It, it, it would depend on, you know, the, the app publisher and how friendly they are. Sure. But, um, yeah, of course. Of course. So you may want to, yeah, you I like, up, okay, cool. All right. Well, maybe that, try automator or, you know, Apple script, uh, uh, automator is a much friendlier way to try to go about this. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, and you could also, you know, here's, um, let's get a little, let's go a little more specific. Why not? We're here. Um, for copying a file, right. He said, he said one of the important things for him is, um, copies of large raw footage collections. So he's got a, you know, a big monster folder of things and wants to copy that over to there. So you could, if there's no, although that I think might be really easy to do with automator, but you could also write a shell script that monitors those two folders or checks them routinely. And when the move is finished, the size of both of those folders or the number of files in both of those folders or something would be the same, right? There's some way you could say, okay, this is now complete. And then you could, of course could have a shell script, you know, fire up an alert. It could send you an email. I mean, you can do anything you want. Um, you know, that's just basically kind of a, you know, if this, then that, although not using if to do it locally, although I'm sure there's also a way we could, we could use if, for something like an After Effects render, my guess is it's rendering out to a specific file, right? And while it's rendering, that file, uh, the size and the modification time will continue to change. And I'm, 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 I'm guessing here. I don't know. Maybe After Effects renders to a temp file somewhere and then copies it all uh, to the location at the end. I don't know. But if you could monitor that file when it stops changing... That's a pretty good indicator that it's finished, but it's a very good indicator that you want to get involved. If that modification time hasn't changed in five minutes or whatever, that's probably, you know, a, a good time for you to check on it and make sure things are either, you know, complete and you're ready to move on or that, you know, you might have a problem. So I don't know. This, these are the things I think about. All right. Good. You want to take us to Susan, John, who also has a bit of a geek challenge? Yes. Okay. So Susan says, greetings, geekers. <laughs> I have a problem slash opportunity for which I need a solution. My son is getting married in September. That's not the problem. <laughs> Good. And wants to set up a photo booth for the guests to record their presence and have some fun. He would like to use my new 10 and a half inch iPad Pro connected to my DSLR, which is a Panasonic Lumix FZ200. He wants to arrange it so that the iPad acts effectively as a monitor to the camera so that the guests can see the photos live and immediately as taken. At present, we are experimenting with an iFi card and Kenai, K-E-N-N-A-I, software. While this works okay, the iPad refuses to stay connected to the iFi and promiscuously finds alternate Wi-Fi connections within minutes of the iFi taking a rest. Is there another way of connecting the Lumix to the iPad such that an iPad such that the iPad stops bullying the camera. <laughs> At present, if I connect them via USB, the iPad forces the camera to only behave like an external flash drive. I have not tried the mini HDMI port on the camera as of yet. I thought I'd ask before buying more cables. Many thanks for any suggestions. Even if it's simply no, it can't be done. May your wombats run free and unfettered. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um... I, I like Wombats, I think. Yeah. I, I've never met one, but um, they seem pretty cool. Uh, you know, off the top of my head, I'm thinking, yeah, so a lot of cameras have a mini HDMI output. I'm wondering if that in and of itself may do it. 
I've, I've experimented with that and you know, oh, it, yeah. it, I mean, I've tried it with my cameras that have it and yeah. So you basically, what you see on the camera is what you see on a external yeah, screen. That wouldn't, that wouldn't display to an no, iPad. It, correct. It would not, okay. it, you, you would need a, a HDMI monitor, of course, yeah. or TV or something like that. Yeah. 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 So that could be one way to do it. But uh, here were some of the thoughts that I had, Dave. So, okay. um, so I have had a Lumix camera, which is Panasonic and yep. it typically has like a glass and they're really nice. And this one's nice too. Um, the only thing that makes me sad about this one, I almost thought I had a solution here. Uh, sadly, this particular camera does not have Wi-Fi. And that, in this case, is a bad thing mm. because it would make it a lot easier to do what you want to do. Well, iFi adds Wi-Fi to your Correct. camera. In a sense. Right. And I'm getting to that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The thing is, I have, so for example, I have a Nikon Coolpix S9700, which has Wi-Fi, but it also has a companion iOS app that can both take and display pictures. So if you had a different camera... And then I'll, I'll go into more detail about that. But um, Panasonic does have companion applications that can talk to their Wi-Fi enabled cameras. Unfortunately, this is not one of them. And I have had the iFi card. So, so I think I have a suggestion in, in this respect, Dave. Um, and that uh, the Wi-Fi pro uh, iFi product has changed uh, over the years here. But I think what it still does in this case is that it is setting up uh, what's known as an ad hoc um, Yes. Wi-Fi connection rather than an infrastructure connection. Well, there's two problems that so it, it's doing that, but also it's um, built to preserve battery life. So after a picture is taken, its Wi-Fi network is only alive for a short period of time. At least I haven't used the, an iFi card in a in a I don't know, maybe a year. Um, but that's how it has always worked for me, that you yes. save the picture. Boom. It wakes up like you said, creates its, its network. I think there was a change so that it would be um, an infrastructure and not an ad hoc network though, but, but maybe not. I, th I thought that was changed, but still the connection's only alive for a short period of time. And then it says, okay, you got what you needed from me. I'm going to go back to sleep and save your camera's battery. Right now. I don't know if there's a firmware update or a setting buried somewhere that yeah. would make it not sleep. Mm. Um, yeah, that would be a good question to ask, because if you if you're in a, a a fixed location, you could leave the camera powered by a battery or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Or plugged into, you know, DC power. Um, right. 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 So it doesn't die. Yeah. Um, now, what you could do also, the, the thing is, to, uh, typically Apple devices will will. uh Ad hoc is low, low on the list. And actually, I, I remember we did experiment with this in a, in a past um, question for different devices, but it was like, why isn't my Mac talking to my ad hoc device? Why is it is finding something else? And one way you could do this, uh, couldn't hurt to try this, is to create a profile right. with Apple Configurator 2 and make that SSID of that ad hoc connection, uh, set up a profile that has just that SSID and say auto join, and that may dissuade the device from uh, looking for something else to talk to. Yep. Yep. Um, and fighting with it. So that's another suggestion. Yeah. Now, one, you may want to try a different architecture. So it sounds like what's happening here is that so the, the i Fi is sending the pictures to the iPad, um, and then they're using this third party uh, service, which looks to be a cloud. Yeah. photo hosting uh, yeah, yeah. type of service. You could do something a little different. Now, unfortunately, the iFi used to be able to push pictures, at least when I used it, to various cloud services like Flickr and uh, or services that had a, a, an option. It looks like that is no longer the case. The yeah. only cloud service that they offer is their own cloud service. And I think you have to throw them some coin in order to implement that. You may want to consider given their cloud service a try. So rather than the iFi pushing it to the iPad. Oh, just have the iPad suck it down from the iFi cloud. Have have the iFi beam it to their cloud and then have the iPad suck it from their cloud. Again, you may yeah. have, I think there's a free trial uh, or you may want to consider, you know, subscribing to their uh, cloud-based service. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Huh, cool. Yeah, let's change the rules a bit. Yeah, um, well, sometimes, sometimes, that you know, you, you want to solve a problem a certain way, and and really the the most important thing is to solve the problem, not 
use the solution path that you want to use. Right. I mean, <laughs> I, well, I mean, you can, it, I, we all get stuck in that. Yeah. So, and yeah. lastly, you may want to consider getting another camera. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> that's, yeah, sure. Well, the thing is that they do have, so I looked in the app store and there are at least two apps. Uh, one is called Panasonic image app and another is called Panasonic Lumix link. Okay. Uh, that look to be free. And if you have a Wi-Fi enabled Lumix. Yeah, uh, sure. That would do it. So maybe rent, uh, you know, so your care. Uh, well, that's true. You can, you can generally rent cameras too. I mean, the, the problem is, you know, Susan's not looking to get into the business of doing this. She's right. looking to do it once, you know, for one day. And so buying a new camera may or may not be the right answer, but renting something for the day might actually be the, you know, if in fact it's the right solution, it might be the right way to go. Yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. So renting and it, you know, if you like, I mean, Lumix is a fine camera. So, you know, get a slightly different one that does have the Wi-Fi uh, or even, you know, like, you know, I said, I got a Nikon and uh, most major camera vendors offer apps that can uh, control and display what's on the camera. There you go. So Sweet. Yeah. So if you guys have any thoughts on this, send them feedback at MacGeekCab.com. We'd love to uh, we'd love to hear them. Good yeah. stuff. We, yeah. we love it when you write to feedback at MacGeekab.com. And also, if you have a thought about this next thing from Karsten, you could send us a note at feedback at MacGeekab.com. And Karsten writes, I'm trying to find the best solution to ensure I am able to track my MacBook Pro 2017 if it is lost or stolen. I know that I can use iCloud and I will. However, I would like to add another layer to further secure my laptop. My goal is to maximize options for retrieving it and get a location. Second objective is ensuring the thief cannot even reuse the hardware. I have always used a product called Lojack from Absolute Software. On the Windows side, the software activates in the BIOS and can't be disabled, and you can't reflash the BIOS to remove it. That means that even if someone wants to reuse or sell the Windows laptop, they can't get rid of the tracking software. On the Mac side, I understand the software is just software, and wiping the laptop also wipes iCloud tracking and the Lojack software. My thoughts on how to ensure I can keep track of the laptop. Uh, it has File Vault enabled in Mac OS Sierra, and I was contemplating just leaving a guest account enabled. This way, my data can't be accessed because of File Vault. The thief can get in and log in as a guest and connect to Wi Fi, and then iCloud and the tracking software can now pinpoint a location. That's smart. My thoughts on keeping all the data secure uh, to prevent the thief from reusing my Mac, of course. Uh, using the firmware password utility via command R under boot and set a firmware password combined with file vault that should do the trick. Or should I also reformat the drive with Mac OS extended journaled encrypted plus file vault plus firmware password? Lots of stuff here. So um, I have some thoughts, but I believe that Mac OS extended journaled encrypted is either the same as or very, very similar to file vault when you're doing it on a whole drive that you boot from. Um, so I don't think you need to do that. File vault is, an, is going to be enough. And if it's not enough, then doing anything else, you know, also adding encrypted and disk utility isn't going to help. So that's my, that's my thought on, on that. Um, the Lojack software is, is certainly, you know, the one that comes top of mind for me. And I think, you know, the problem is if you set a firmware uh, password on the Mac, then the thief can't log in and can't connect to Wi-Fi and then can't, you know, you can't find your Mac. So it's an interesting little catch 22. I like your idea about having a guest account enabled um, so that people can get in. Uh, that's, you know, it's smart. What do you think, John? What I think is I'm going to tell you about an article that I found Dave okay. that has a lot of very good suggestions on how one can do this tracking. Yep. And it's called how to track your stolen laptop without installing tracking programs. Nice. The thing is like it or not, a lot of the software that you use day to day, um, assuming that whoever runs away with your laptop doesn't reformat it. Sure. Um, and leaves it in its state. Um, I actually thought this article was very clever. So it's at a uh, trendblog.net and it was yep. something written back in 2014, but I think it still applies. So of course they talk about 
iCloud, you know, sure. we just talked about here, find my iPhone, find my Mac, and that's certainly a good service. But then I didn't really thought about this, and this helped crystallize this, Dave, is um, a lot of the services that you use, including Dropbox and Facebook and Gmail, buried somewhere will keep a log of sessions that are established. That's true. Your computer and them. And it, it will typically include something like an IP address and maybe even a location. And if you're out and about all the time, like Dave and I are, well, you, Dave more than me, but um, still, I've actually had, uh, when running certain software on a certain device, if it notices that I'm in a place that's not, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, it'll be like, uh, yeah, by the way, you seem to be in Chicago. Um, are you, are you? Are you sure about that? And it's like, oh, yeah, no, that, 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 that's, that's me. Cool. Yeah. And it might ask you to do some second layer of authentication or something. Uh, right. It'll yeah. reprop for a password. Yeah. So, um, so if at, in all likelihood, you're probably using either Dropbox or Gmail or Facebook. And I think Yahoo, I use Yahoo Mail. And I think it, it does that as it does well. The same thing. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. So assuming that the machine is in the same state running the same software and the thief is, uh, you know, overconfident. <laughs> right. Um, you may, you know, from another machine, uh, be able to see where your lost machine or stolen machine, um, is, is, uh, phoning in. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, if you folks have any other thoughts, maybe some other third party software that works a little differently or something like that, let us know. We'd love to hear about it. And if you're a premium listener, send it to premium at MacGeekab.com. And in fact, I want to say thank you to all of you premium listeners who wound up contributing this week, either manually or via your recurring subscriptions, which you can configure at MacGeekab.com slash premium. We had, uh, I believe, four renewals on our biannual plan. James K., David H., David C., Alan W., thank you to all of you. Tim M. joined the biannual plan for the first time. Thank you, Tim. Uh, actually, Tim might be a renewal, like a, 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 a lapsed renewal, we'll call it. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. But regardless, thanks to to all of you. On the monthly plan, we have lots of renewals. Elizabeth B., Jim E., Chris F., Dave C., Michael L., Jason A., Bob P., David F., Frank A., Martin T., Shannon K., W. Brooks, Doug L., Barry F., Michael L., Mark R., all renewals and Ward J joining the monthly plan for the first time. Thank you to all of you. And uh, let's see. We have uh, three one-time contributions. Stephen K at 50, Bob B and Robert F each at 25. Thank you so much to all of you. I really mean it every week that I say this. Um, I know it's part of the routine, but it is far from routine for us. Really, um, it means a lot. And, uh, and if you can help us out and you'd like to, we appreciate it. And if you can't, that's okay too. Obviously, um, the interaction engagement that we have with all of you is, is awesome. And one of the ways that that is awesome is that you also support our sponsors whom we try to keep very relevant for you. And this week's first sponsor is text expander from smile at, uh, text expander.com slash geek text expander. I say it all the time is one of those things that I can't use a Mac without, um, you know, text expansion has become such a normal part of so many of our lives. If, and if you're not using it, uh, it might just blow you away when you start doing it. In fact, uh, surprisingly, John Donahue over at backbeat media hadn't been using text expander and Jeff and I got him rolling on it, um, on a trial account this week and, or last week, I guess. And, uh, He's already been like, dude, this is amazing. And it is, you know, and you can do simple things with it, right? You can put your, I put my phone number in, um, you know, I, I, in fact, I put several of my phone numbers. I use C603 for my office, O6 or C603 for my cell, O603 for my office. Cause my area code 603, it types out my phone number. I don't have to think, I don't have to worry about fat fingering it. What it puts in, I know is correct. I use DHADD for my address. I use JBADD for John's address. If I ever need to put our addresses into things, I use uh, different little shortcuts for my email signatures so that I can customize those on the fly. If the one that's automatically pulled in by my mail client isn't exactly the one I want. Uh, and the way this works is when I type, you know, like DHADD text expander 
jumps to action and replaces DHADD with whatever I've told it I want. In this case, it's my address. So it's got, you know, things on different lines. It works just fine. But you can also do cool things like uh, if I want to tell somebody that uh, your, you know, your your product was mentioned on Mac Geek Gab, right? I can do, you know, MGGM, which is Mac Geek Gab mentioned. That'll do two things. Number one, it takes what's on the clipboard because Text Expander is smart like this, which I've already put the link to the show on the clipboard. And it builds that into into the text that it's going to do. But it doesn't stop there. It also prompts me to put the person's first name in. So, it'll you know, it'll say like, you know, greetings. And then I'll say Greg. And then it, you know, fills out the rest of the form. And it'll say, I just wanted to let you know that we mentioned your product. And then there's another blank that it prompts me to fill in text expander on Mac Geek Gab recently. Here's a link. It puts in the link from the clipboard. If you have any questions for us, blah, blah, blah. You know, thanks, uh, Dave and John. Right. And then there you go. So that email, I know I'm not going to screw it up. I know that it's going to be it's going to tell people what I want to want to tell them. It's going to have, you know, the right link to that. But I also put a link to like the general show and give them some data about the show and that sort of thing. And it's all right there. And I don't have to type it. Not only does it save me time, but it saves me stress because I don't have to worry about getting it wrong. Uh, you know, and every, everything you do these days, text-based, it's important. We do so much that way. So you got to check it out. Smilesoftware.com. Oh, sorry. I mean, you can get there from smilesoftware.com, but even faster, go to textexpander.com slash geek. You can get a 30 day free trial of text expander right there. It works on your Mac. You can use it on your iPhone. It's totally cross platform. Uh, they even have a windows version. So you're good to go. Try it for 30 days. Textexpander.com slash geek. Our thanks. Very kind. Thanks to the folks at smile for sponsoring the show. All right. Maybe some little tips included in the, uh, in the text expander spot as well, John, that's what we like to do while we're at it with tips. Let's go to Brett here, John, because Brett has a great little tip about customizing your passwords. He says, I've run into issues using the password generator in one password when needing to include a symbol. The website that I'm on may only allow a certain no limited number of symbols in the password or a limited uh, group of symbols in the password. And without fail, the generated password always uses a symbol that's not in that website's list. Usually I just click regenerate until one shows up. The other day, Brett says, I clicked regenerate 23 times to finally get a valid password, either the wrong symbol or the correct symbol, but it was the first character in the password. So I headed over to the 1Password forums to see if there was any way to pick the symbols. In one thread, one of the moderators said that the generated password can be modified that's when it hit me. So here's the tip. Set the number of symbols to zero, generate a password, and then click right in the little window there where it shows you the password. Type in a valid symbol wherever you want. Now I get a good password on the first try, he says, and one password still generates this random thing and saves it for me. So that's a good tip. I like it. Thanks so much for that, Brett. I never knew. I've been using one password for years. I never knew that that was editable. So I love tips well, like hey. this. <clears throat> The same thing, you know, I've run into the same thing, and this is a fish shake to any site that restricts what special characters you can use. Get some better software, people. <laughs> Your parser is raw, is bad <laughs> if you don't allow certain characters. But the other thing is this, you know, I can almost see, and I'll, I'll throw down the gauntlet, is that the right term, uh, to either LastPass or one password. If they were watching what we know that they see what the website is saying, you right. know, they're parsing what the website is sure. saying. Yeah, Wouldn't yeah, it be yeah. swell if they saw the error message saying you must use characters, blah, 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 and adjusted what oh, they generated accordingly? Yeah. I mean, I can see it happen. So if I can see if I can see it and do something smart, like type in my own special character. Oh yeah. Maybe they could figure out how to do it. So, so let's, let's see which one of them can figure out how to do this first. Cause I know it's technically possible. Of course. Um, of course. The other thing is that couldn't websites have embedded somewhere, uh, you know, maybe a hidden field or something that says what the valid characters are. I don't know if anybody's developed a standard oh, for this. There may. Sure. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. 
yeah, there's yeah, a hidden yeah, field yeah. saying, okay, you know, left friend, right friend, star, uh, but these are the, or here's all the valid characters uh, for a password. Right. Mr. Password Manager, here, please use this. Yeah, with everybody, well, not everybody, everybody should be using a password manager. But, you know, with with people using password managers, it's not um, not ridiculous to think that maybe there should be a way to hint a password manager in the right direction for your website. And who knows, may, maybe that actually exists, John. I, I mean, I don't know for certain that it doesn't. <laughs> so, yeah. I like it. Interesting stuff. Fun. All right. Uh, where are we here? Let's, um, yeah, we, we've promised that we talk a little bit about this. And so we'll bring in, in Tannel here to start this conversation about Mac OS. Hi, Sierra. And, uh, and then we'll let it continue. It's, it's, um, it's certainly time to invite your questions about Hi, Sierra and iOS 11, to be fair. Um, we're using both of them. Uh, internally here, I'm actually relying on both um, my I've got High Sierra on my laptop and I've got iOS 11 on actually both now my iPhone and my iPad. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about my quote unquote, my iPad um, in a minute because there's something else that we're testing. But uh, but yeah, feel free to start sending in your questions about that stuff. Uh, Tannel writes. Um there's something very positive that I wanted to share regarding Hi Sierra. I just installed the public beta on my 2013 500 gigabyte Retina MacBook Pro, and the install time was incredibly fast. The upgrade, which also included conversion to the AP, uh, AFS file system, right? I think he's got it written wrong here. Uh, it took only 30 minutes. I never had so fast an install time. and Or APFS is, is what it is uh, for the file system. Um yeah, and I I would agree. I I don't know that the install felt fast to me, but it certainly didn't feel slow. Um, and I did it on my 2011 MacBook Air, so this is an old machine. And to be very fair, I had basically gotten to the point where it was like, okay, it's time to replace this. It's just too slow. Installing High Sierra on it uh, did convert it to APFS, uh, which happened sort of. Um, I mean, I didn't even know. I, I knew it was going to happen, but. There was no great fanfare about it. It just happened and has worked fine. And my machine is usable again uh, in a lot of different ways, but mostly it's all those background processes that, uh, that seem to creep up like with, you know, El Capitan and, and definitely Sierra where it wants to, you know, photo library D just wants to run and, and slurp up everything I have in the background or a um, uh, calendar sync or whatever it is that's really syncing your address book, even though it's called a calendar sync or whatever. Um, that wanted to run and use 100 percent of my CPU or MD worker, the spotlight process updater wanted to run and, and consume all of my CPU. Don't get me wrong. Those things still exist in High Sierra and they still want to run, but I've never seen them totally consume the CPU and crater the system. They all seem to be throttled back so that there's always some CPU left for you. And, and it has made a huge difference for me uh, in using the, using that machine. It's like, I can wake it up and just use it now as opposed to having to wait and it churns and stumbles and it's slow that that doesn't happen anymore. And that machine's limited it. You know, its biggest problem is it's Ram. It's only got four gigs. Um, and that's soldered in. There's no, there's no, either no way to change it or certainly no easy way to change it on that. Um, but I've, I've been very impressed with high Sierra on that machine and I can't wait to test it on, um, on a, you know, on, on a, a, a newer, beefier machine. And I'll put it on my, my retina iMac soon, but I haven't yet. So well, thoughts, Dave, on, thoughts on that, John? Well, of course the good news, Dave, the reason that you're probably seeing it uh, perform quite a, a a little bit better is um it's all 64 bits perhaps right. uh, yeah i guess so and i'm verifying this because i'm looking right now in activity monitor so i'm running the beta i, I recently installed it and i have a tip on how to avoid some weirdness but okay. uh, looking right now all the uh, all the processes uh, if you turn on the kind column in mm -hmm. activity monitor they're all 64 bit I'll have to check that. I, I mean, I, you're right, though, because it, it won't run 32. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. The current OS still has some 32 bit artifacts. Totally. Which, uh, yeah. Which, you know, 64 bits is better. It's faster. Yeah. Um, 
The one thing I want to add, uh, so I installed it on an external drive, and we'll talk drive talk in a moment here. But sure. um, here's one thing I noticed, Dave. So the thing is, I, I ran the beta installer download um, on my day-to-day machine, yep. but I installed the OS on an external drive. Okay. Okay. Um, here's something that's going to happen, and I'm going to tell you how to make it so it doesn't happen anymore. What happens is that they turn on, because what happened shortly thereafter, after I, I installed it, Dave, and then I re, you know, re, or was just you know running my day-to-day machine, all of a sudden it came up and it said, hey, there's a beta of Safari available. You want to install that? And I'm like, no, no, go away, go away. <laughs> Here, here's the tip. Um, go to System Preferences App Store. You're going to see that there's a selection now that says your computer is set to receive beta software updates. You may want to turn that off if you did what I did in that you installed it from one machine, but you, you downloaded the installer on one machine, but you installed it on a different drive. Sure. Cause I don't, I don't care about the Safari beta stuff. <laughs> so there's that flag. And I think that's actually what happens when you install this is that you, you run an app called, you know, beta configurator yep. and, it, and it puts your machine in a mode where it, it will then attempt to install betas of any sort. Which oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, that's for public betas, not for developer betas. Right. Uh, well, this was, I, I installed the developer beta. You did? So I oh, think okay. It's for both. Oh, okay. All right. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So <clears throat> I've been, you know, uh, we were talking about this before the show too, but it, you know, it's it, high Sierra. There's not a whole lot new, right? It's it, 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 in, in terms of UI still there's some and it's fine, but, um, but this is, you know, this is the, uh, the the maintenance release the under the hood just stuff that that keeps it cooking thing like like snow sierra <laughs> i mean i i looked and you know the thing is i looked dave and as far as i can tell nothing in the you know the the system preferences i looked at all of the panes in there and i couldn't see anything that jumped out as me as being different oh, I, think, I don't th- i think there I don't are think different things okay i i did a quick yeah, run through and and nothing jumped out as me as being very different from. Yeah, whatever, from yeah, it's not very different. Running. You're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. But, um, but definitely, uh, and I've heard this from other folks too that that have seen, you know, performance improvement and just a, just an overall experience improvement. And to be fair, it's still beta, right? So there's probably some l- code that hasn't yet been fully optimized. Although I'm not convinced of that. Uh, things do change and there yeah, there if you're going to run it, know that you will have software that won't work or won't work properly yet. Um that and that's just par for the course. And the same is true with iOS 11. I've actually been really, really liking iOS 11, especially on my iPad. So I first ran it on my iPad mini um, and I didn't put it on my phone or, you know, watch the update to watch OS on my watch because I'd been traveling so much. But as soon as I got back from my uh, our fishing weekend this past weekend in New York, um, seeing the band fish because it's tough to fish in Manhattan on any other way, um, we uh, I, I installed it on there and then. I like, and of course I, and I like it on, on my phone. Uh, I am finding slightly reduced battery life with the developer betas, uh, which is not surprising, uh, but, but it's, it's been running quite well. We're, but like I said, where I really find it beneficial is on the iPad. And, uh, and I've been an iPad mini user for a long time and decided, well, it seems like that particular size of iPad is been, has been deprioritized by Apple. And I thought, well, it's gonna. What's my next iPad gonna be? Where do I go from here? And I did some soul searching, and then I made a phone call, and uh, and from the angle of looking at it as a, perhaps an upgrade path for iPad Mini owners, um, I'm now testing uh, an iPad Pro ten and a half inch, which I really, you know, I had played with in the hands-on room at WWDC, and uh, and was sort of blown away instantly by a lot of things about it. You know, the refresh rate on it's amazing. Um, it, the size of it isn't, it's certainly bigger than an iPad mini, but the way that screen, you know, goes closer to the edges and all of that. And I was really impressed with, it. so I've only had it for two days. 
I'm just getting up to speed with it. I need to figure out what case is best. I've got Apple smart keyboard with it, which is very, very cool, but it isn't the right case to have on it all the time. Uh, but it is really nice to have on it when you want to type. And of course I've got an Apple pencil with it too. So I'll, I'll, we'll talk more about that as I've had more experiential time with it. But, uh, but thus far, even like reading in bed with it, it's not, um, it doesn't feel as big as I thought it might compared to reading in bed with the mini. So that's, the, that's the beginning of my, my 10 and a half review. We'll, we'll give it a few more weeks and then I'll, then I'll dig in a little deeper for you, but feel free to ask questions about that because I, I am doing my very best to not pick up my iPad mini other than the, I have a separate iPad mini that I use for gigs and, uh, and things like that. Although I've been thinking about using the iPad pro for, for gigs because the bigger screen is really nice. So anyway, um, yeah. So we're done with high Sierra. We are. Well, we don't have to be, we can come back to it. Okay. Um, one thing that I think is interesting, um, uh, as you may know, that Apple uh, recently announced uh, the the piles of money that they they raked in. Yes, <laughs> and I believe the iPad Pro uh, was a cause for them for for their iPad sales. Um, that, that's to, a uh, fair uh, assumption. Well. Yes, which even when I saw it, I was like, "Wow, that's sexy." Even uh, I may get oh, one because yeah. nice, it, it looks to be a much more usable. Uh, or general purpose device than, than some of the others. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would agree. And of course, Apple made more money than anybody. Sure. <laughs> what did I see? They're actually one of the top holders of us debt. Of course they are. Yeah. <laughs> That's well, cheaper scary. form to borrow money than it is to patriot money from, uh, th that they have overseas. So there you go. <laughs> but it's the fine. thing is they, they kind of own us. Apple kind of owns this country. Well, right? Like, yeah, yeah, that's no great surprise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you um, want to go back to High Sierra? Well, the one thing that, you know, maybe I, I didn't uh, approach the install properly. Uh, the, the drive that I put it on, I had already formatted as HFS. Now, I, I suppose what I probably should have done is run the installer. And I think within the installer, I could have formatted the drive using the new file system. And is I didn't it a, do that. Is it an SSD or a spindle? It's a rotational. Oh, then, it, then no, that's why it didn't offer to upgrade you to APFS. APFS <sighs> right now is limited only to SSDs. And and that probably will remain that way. It is it is an OS that is built, you know, with SSDs in mind. That's that's one of the major but, points of it. Yeah. But my question is, could I or should I? Uh, well, one, can I convert the drive that I installed it on to APFS or no? No, I don't think. You, I, well, I don't know. I, I've I've converted other external drives to APFS, but they've all been they've all been uh, SSDs. I don't think you can convert a, a rotational drive to APFS right now. That may change, okay. and I convert, may be wrong about that. But if it was an SSD, could I mean, is yes. there a conversion utility? Um. There is, as part of the installer, is there a separate conversion utility? I don't know if Disk Utility will do it, to be honest. It, it should, though. I mean, obviously, if it's there as part of the installer, it can be done after the fact. I think maybe there is. Talk to Martellero about that. I think he's done something like that in, internally here at TMO. Okay. Or I think somebody's posted, and uh, there's some magic from the command line that I could do to maybe. Um, yeah, 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 you know, exactly. Yeah, but yeah, it's, yeah. You know, the same thing we ran into, you know, with our Synologies is that, you know, they, they have this new file system, but I don't think they have a utility that will convert from the old to the new. Is it? They don't. The, it's been the driving me crazy. Is, you got to reformat. Yeah. But I've kind of been just wanna... waiting with the Synology for, for them to, um, to, to just say, oh, hey, here's the, here's the utility. You're good to go. I don't know. We'll yeah. See. I mean, the final things I noticed. So Safari has, you know, a couple of things that they talked about. It's uh, it's interesting, you know, so the, you know, uh, videos, uh, you know, the annoyance of videos that start playing, you know, they'll allow you to, to squelch that. Um, I noticed there's a new item in the Safari menu saying settings for this website. So you can fine tune the behavior of web pages uh, per nice. website. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, they have also have this you know cross you know the thing that makes it so any site you go to has an ad for something that you bought from amazon it's like dude stop <laughs> i'll have to do more surfing but you know that that seems to be on by default so uh and then i notice in photos there's you know some new 
uh, editing tools. Photos is is improving. Uh, I'd say it's you know still not at the level of you know some of the pro tools, but for most people, you know they're they're yeah they're absolutely making uh, advances. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, we'll keep talking about it, and uh, feel free to send in your questions. We are uh, we are both enjoying and suffering through running the the latest betas, so that uh, so that we're ready for you. Um, it, John, I want to have a little discussion, uh, and there's other things that we probably want to get to. So hopefully we can we can c- keep this condensed. Um, I, I promise. You got a new cable modem recently, and uh, as, as you kind of as you mentioned in in the last show, and you had uh, you had an issue provisioning it. Yes. So um, the new cable modem arrived. You plugged it in. You got it up and running. Right. All right. So so what they uh, so what happens is uh, so I disconnected the old one and then I returned it to them so they don't charge me the mm. fee. And then I put the new yeah, one in. And right. the thing is, of course, they know this because the uh, MAC address. Uh, the hardware address of it is different. Right. And so they're like, and actually the process was pretty straightforward except for one thing. So it came up and it said, yeah, we're going to redirect you to a page. They're like, uh, yeah, it looks like you you got a new cable modem. Do you want to swap out the old one? And they listed the Mac address of the old one. I verified that the, it was the same. It's printed on the modem. And I'm like, yeah, let's, let's do this. And then they go to the next page and they're like, okay, great. Can you put in your last name, your account number, and your phone number. And it's like, oh, well, yeah, I mean, of course I have my ISP's account number memorized. And the catch 22 here is that because you're in a mode where the only page you can see is the provisioning page, there was no way for, there was no way using that connection to right. get it. And it's like, guys, that that's kind of silly. <laughs> I, yeah. Fortunately, I have Wi-Fi through them. Sure. And I was able to go to the website. Uh, or run their app. I think I ran their app and uh, oh, was able the to then punch in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but it, it, it made me chuckle that they put me in this situation and, and nobody's ever pointed out to them that that's not a piece of information that people necessarily have memorized or in front of them. So when you do this with Comcast, you have two options. You can do exactly that. Just manually enter your account number and, and that. The other option with Comcast, uh, as I remember it, it's been about a year and a half since I've done this is that it did offer to let me log into my existing account. And it was like, hey, here's this. But if you don't know your account, well, then, you know, or if you if you already have have created, a, a you know, an account on our system and you're an existing customer, you can log into that. And then it and then it worked. Um, my guess is if you bought this cable modem from Optimum. Oh, you didn't buy it from them. You bought it from. Oh, no, else. I actually this modem. Because I bought it through them. Yeah. Uh, says Eris on it, but it also, the other one didn't, but it also has the Optimum logo on it. So it is so a Optimum. So you might have had your account number on a, on a piece of paper that came in the box with that modem. They claimed that that would be the case, but it was not. The only okay. piece of paper that was in the box was some packing slip. So, so. my advice to everybody is, is this, whatever your note taking app of choices and and trust me on this, it's worth having one, even if it's just storing a few notes in Apple Notes, but it could be Evernote or whatever you like. But hopefully something that syncs amongst your devices, because that's really easy to do now, especially even with Apple Notes. And Apple Notes is really good. Um, create a note for your ISP, you know, your cable company or your DSL company or your files company, whatever it is. Put in there their contact phone number, your account number with them any other relevant details. And then you can also log things in there like, you know, okay, on, on August 6th, 2017, I talked to Debbie there who helped me, you know, solve a technical problem with, you know, with this, that, or the other thing. And then you've got this history, right? And you, and you've always got it right there. And I also use that to store. Sometimes you get a secret phone number or a non-published phone number to say, Hey, in order to call me back, do this, put that there too, because Six or 16 months from now, you might need that or you might find having it a handy thing. So definitely worth doing that. And to be fair, I do the same thing with my power company, because when my power goes out, I need to contact them. And it's way easier if I can log into my account, like from my phone or whatever. <clears throat> Obviously, the same thing with your water company or, you know, whatever the whatever other services you have. Um, create that in your notes and that way you've got it. 
so that it's just there and you don't have to think about it. So, yep. and, and with, uh, with Apple notes and certainly with Evernote, you can share a note or even a notebook with Evernote with other people. So if you have family members that would also benefit from having that information or, you know, having one shared repository to put it all, well, share it up. There you go. So, and the one last thing with this, Dave, so hats off to Eero, uh, cause I think what they did was intentional. So I noticed then when I put in the new cable modem yeah. that I was all of a sudden now getting a paltry 100 megabits downstream. <sighs> right. Yeah. First world problems. The thing is, uh, uh, Optima has a promotion where until the end of the year, if you have 100 service, uh, they say you'll get 200 service. So right. I got on the horn, called up, said, yeah, um, you know, I just got this new modem. C can you give me the uh, 200? She looked and she's like, oh, yeah, that says it on your bill. Did it immediately. And I was shocked because I wanted to verify that that they had actually yeah. re reconfigured it. I ran the Eero app and the Eero app already had run a speed test and said, yep, you're getting 200 down. Nice. Like, Thanks. So they must have seen the modem cycle and said, yeah. oh, well, let's do it again. We should probably yeah. run it again. So here's um, here's another piece of advice for you is I, I recommend rebooting your cable modem once a month. And then the only reason is this. When there when you get a software upgrade for your cable modem, or I should say when your cable modem is provisioned to have a software upgrade, it usually takes a reboot of the modem in order for that upgrade to come through, especially with Comcast, I've seen it where my modem has been provisioned for faster speeds because Comcast does does this pretty regularly. It seems like once every 12 to 18 months, they just say, OK, whatever you are, if you're on the Blast Pro plan, now the, the speed caps are, you know, 30 percent higher than they used to be. But without rebooting your modem. Uh, you don't get that new profile and therefore you don't get the speeds. It's actually your cable modem that decides how fast your internet connection will go, but it gets that instruction via a profile from your cable company. Um, and no, there's really no easy way and really no way at all to pump your own profile into the, into that modem. Um, obviously that would be a breach of your service agreement with your cable company, but also technically it's really just not possible. Um, they've, they've, they've worked this out, trust me, but, um, n not that I would do that, but I looked into it for technical reasons, um, <laughs> so that I could in instruct and inform and save you folks from wasting your time. Uh, but, uh, and I'm also really frustrated with 10 megabits upstream and I can't seem to get any faster than that. So, you know, sometimes frustration leads to experimentation. Uh, the, um, but by rebooting the modem, you get those speeds. And I think Comcast would have eventually pushed a reset through to my modem. But uh, but in most cases, I've found and a lot of times, actually, I get an email from Comcast that says, hey, we bumped up your speeds, but you need to reboot your modem. And a lot of times it's like, yeah, I, I did that a week and a half ago and I already have them. So yeah. so there that that's my advice is just reboot semi regularly. Sure. You can log into your cable modem at um one from inside your house, you have to do this. 192.168.100.1. Again, 192.168.100.1. Put that into your web browser. You can log into your modem. It might ask you for a password. Generally speaking, if you search up your modem's model number online, you can find out the default password. And in my experience, that's been uh, that's been what's set there. Once you log in, you can see all kinds of great diagnostic information that we've talked about. But you can also see your profile name. And it's usually a file name that seems cryptic. Take that, copy it, store it in that note we mentioned before. That way you can look and see, did it change? Because sometimes it changes and that's handy to know. So anyway, there we go. Cable oh, modem yeah. advice. I'm glad you got your new modem. That's good stuff, man. Yeah, I see this here in my event log. Yeah. I see two events that happened when I first got it. And they said, SW download init by a config file yeah. sw download so that's well it's going to do that every time you boot it will download that profile every single time in my experience it's not just when you get a new one it pulls down okay. it pulls and down that, that firmware every time and right. that file has my speeds and all sorts of other yeah. wonderful things wonderful things yeah yeah but mostly speed limits and the other nice thing I saw is that in addition to having twice as many downstream channels as the old one is that my power levels are better and my signal to noise ratio is better. By how much? Uh, the power levels are all now close to zero, which is ideal for downstream. Okay. So, so I've read. Yeah. And the SNR um, used to be in the 30s 
and and the, the the greater the number, the better. And now my SNR signal to noise ratio is uh, in the forties. Well, plus I have twice as many channels. So, uh, and then the downstream, it's uh, forty four points. Uh, uh, my upstream is uh, is is fine. Yeah, but I think cool. those numbers uh, went in the right direction as well. Yeah, good. So, uh, cool, exciting. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good stuff. All right, we have um, we have several things from the last show to go through. Um, tips and comments, and maybe even some questions that we're going to try and squeeze into the next you know twelve minutes here. So, SJ writes in response to show six sixty seven. Um, he says, uh, I tried all the software you mentioned to recover from a drive, uh, except for trying the service of drive savers. He says, none of them work to recover files from a drive that I had f accidentally formatted. The only software I found that truly worked is R dash studio from R dash tools technology. And we'll put a link in the show notes. That just says there's software, uh, saved me once on a windows machine. And once again, now on a Mac, I've encouraged them to advertise, but they never seem to. So they are at r studio.com. I'd never heard of them before. Um, not a great surprise for a company that's not doing any marketing, but, uh, <laughs> but we will put their link in the show notes and, um, and we'll go on SJ's recommendation that perhaps it's worth trying. So thank you for that. Uh, from show seven, uh, sorry, not show seven, show six, 68, Michael writes, he says, uh, you helped out Todd who asked about the difference between iTunes and iCloud backups for iOS devices. His concern was that he only had five gigs of iCloud storage and didn't know how much stuff, particularly photos his phone was likely to send. Your answer was good, but didn't go far enough. What you missed was that you can individually select which apps are backed up to iCloud, go to settings, storage iCloud and usage, go to iCloud from there, go to manage storage and go to backups, this iPad or iPhone. At this point, you can see what the backup size is and also see when the next backup si scheduled size will be. This is useful, but there's more Then select choose data to backup, show all apps. This will show you a list of all of your apps and how much is being stored by each on iCloud. You can turn them on and off. Photos is included here, so you can actually disable photo backups if you so choose. Very, very good. Thank you, Michael. I like it. It's good stuff. Right, John? Yeah? Sweet. Uh, you want to take Dave's, John, or is that up to me? Oh, uh, we can take Dave. Okay. So, um, Dave, Dave, Dave. Hold on. There we are. Okay. This isn't just Dave. Thanks. This is Dave and Jeff and Michael, and I'm trying to remember, uh, uh, yeah. Andy. Yeah, we and, got a number of, yes. uh, 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 I'll, I'll say fish shakes. Yes. So, um, anyways, one of many pieces of feedback regarding this topic, so we can be entirely clear. And he says, John, twice I've heard you advocate for the 3 two, one backup strategy. Sadly, I think you've got the definition wrong. Three backups, two local, one offsite. As stated, the two and the one are saying the same thing. And fortunately, the one you are trying to stress is correct. But the way I first heard it on the Twit Network, I believe from the person who created it, is this. Three backups, two different media, one offsite. This is increasingly difficult with the amount of data we hoard, but with photographs, this could be achieved by having a printed copy of the most important photos or storing copies or rotating drives as well as SSD. Thank you very much, Dave. Yeah, totally right. We said it twice. We missed it both times. So it's, uh, yeah, three backups, two different media. So don't store it. The, the point being, and it's a very good point, don't rely on one drive to, uh, to be two backups. Or even one drive to be your boot drive and a backup. I, I made that mistake. I had a big honking drive and I partitioned it and I cloned to the other partition. Thankfully, I didn't get bit by the obvious problem with that. If the drive dies, guess what? So does the clone. <laughs> so now different media. Very good. You know, this actually came in handy for me recently too, Dave, in that I had a need to uh, get some old tax forms that, uh, so what I do currently, I'm not quite, you know, caveman mode here, but what I do is that I do PDFs. Okay. And I fill them out and I mail them to sure. the IRS along with the check. Um, well, the, I had a need to get some that are archived. And of course, they're stored on one of my computers. And then I do 
you know, the, the whole backup strategy is that, you know, I back it up to multiple different locations. Well, here, I think what happened, Dave, is that at some point when I implemented the save my documents to iCloud mechanism, I think something got lost because some of the data wasn't there in that it was only in like two folders for two years. The, I still had the folders oh, yeah. for the other years, but there were no documents in them. I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? What I did, Dave, was I went to a time machine backup that was sure. back in December before I did the side cloud migration. Uh, and sure enough, they were there. So in this case, it was different media. One yep. was my local hard drive and one was my time machine backup. Totally. Totally. So this is why you do this sort of thing. I don't know what hiccuped in. I don't know why I didn't complete uh, copying that stuff to iCloud. Right. And that's the thing is you like the, the, the point is, yes, it would be good to know, but. It didn't. The fact that it didn't copy to iCloud is the fact that matters. And you had it somewhere else. So sweet. Thank you Dave. again. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for keeping us honest on that. Good stuff. Laura writes and says, let me find Laura here. Um, I was just listening to 668 when I heard uh, you talking about the person that said not all of his devices were updating and apps uh, updating their apps. And he couldn't figure out why. I've noticed the same problem happening in the past year to my iPad, but not my iPhone or MacBook Pro. I don't believe it has anything to do with corrupt data because once my iPad freezes and reboots on its own without me doing anything, the apps will eventually continue to update without any problems. I believe it's a combination of three things that causes my particular issue. I have an older iPad with only one gig of RAM and less than one gig of storage left. I'm trying to update multiple apps in one sitting, sometimes eight or more, many of them larger in size. And I have extremely slow Internet. My only solution has been to update the smaller apps first, two or three at a time, then update the larger apps one at a time. So far, it's been freezing and rebooting only with Facebook Messenger. So I usually wait and update that one last. The other larger apps have fortunately been updating fine as long as it's time. Sweet. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, it could it could very well be that, too. There's there's lots of different things. Craziness, craziness, craziness. All right. And three questions from the last two shows that I think we can squeeze through here, John. So number one comes from Allison Sheridan over at podfeet.com. We have an interesting story to share from her that we'll save for another episode. She said um, in show 667, you mentioned that by looking at all of the lights on your switch, you knew it was in a loop. How did you know that? And what did you mean by loop? So um, the answer to the, the first question, how did I know is because I've seen it before and I know what it looks like, <laughs> but to, to, to be, to be far more clear about it. Um, even the first time that I saw my network looping and by, by loop, I mean that my network was connected to itself. So every packet was coming that, that went out of the switch was then coming back through another channel. And it was because my, one of my Linksys Velop uh, units was malfunctioning and was sending packets out the Ethernet port and letting, letting those same packets come back in wirelessly because it was trying to mesh it all. It didn't it had sort of forgotten that it had an Ethernet backhaul. So it was just linking everything together and not blocking the Wi-Fi one. Uh, so it created this loop. And of course, that you know, increases traffic and, and things. Then it can't pass any nothing on the network can pass. Um, so that's what I meant by a loop. Um, Normally, the way I knew is that normally the lights on my switches and your network switches, they flash, but not all at the same time and not in what I would consider a consistent pattern. Uh, they flash quickly. Don't get me wrong. But when you look at them, it's very random um, and, and, you know, you can kind of see things happening when there's a loop or some other problem where the switch is clogged. The lights are almost lit 100 percent of the time, but they're just strobing together very, very quickly with no deviation. And it's a pretty obvious thing. If you, if you go and like, look at your switch now, you don't have to spend a lot of time with it, but maybe put on some good music and like trip out to it a little bit. Um, you, you'll get a feel for what that looks like. You really only need to look at it for like five seconds and you'll kind of get a feel for it. If, and when you have a network problem and you can't pass any data on your network, take a look at that switch again. And if it's just, if it, the, the pattern's different and it's just like almost fully lit and just strobing, then you'll know, OK, time to just power down the switch. Or like I said, you know, I I just started pulling things out one by one until it calmed down. And then I knew. So, so that's how I knew, John. It's crazy. You're better than me, man. Well, you know, I I mean, I see the 
blinking lights, but I, I couldn't tell just by that if there was a problem. <laughs> I'm the switch whisperer. Uh, okay, uh, two more. Let's see if we can get through these. Donna asks, she said, in 668, there was a suggestion to have multiple time machine destinations locally that you back up to. How exactly does one set that up? That's a good question. Um, and I think this started in El, El Capitan, I believe. But um, but in any event, most uh, or all recent versions of, of Mac OS let you do this. Go to system preferences, go to time machine, click add or remove backup disk there. Uh, and then you can add another backup disk. You can add multiple backup disks here. And it doesn't replace the previous one. Of course, you can remove one as the instructions say, but you can add to it. Once you've got more than one here, it will start to cycle through all of them when you do your backups. And that's how you do it. It's that simple. So, yeah, it's good stuff, Donna. And it's a it's a great way to kind of hit that that number two we talked about uh, in the backup strategy to have multiple uh, media to which you back up. This is one one way to do that. So good stuff. Lastly, because we care, Joel asks, in 668, you indicated your family was using the two terabytes of data shared on iCloud and that they weren't running iOS 11. I tried, and the only person who could join was my son, who is on the public beta of iOS 11. All the other family members received a, this page is unable to load error. I just wanted you to be aware. You are totally right, Joel. Uh, and I didn't fully explain how I got this to happen, so I will. Um, I have a spare iPhone, but you could do this with a spare iPad or anything that can run iOS 11. And you could even do it with your main one, but it gets a little tricky. Uh, I wiped that phone when I put iOS 11 on it. And then one by one, I logged. Uh, my son is already on the public beta like your son. He wanted to be running it. So that was easy. But for my wife and my daughter who didn't want to start running the public beta, um, although my wife's on it with her iPad now, uh, I logged their iCloud accounts in. I left their existing devices exactly as they were. I didn't have to do anything there. Logged in with their uh, their iCloud accounts on the spare iPhone immediately in the iCloud preference pane went and turned off everything so that it wasn't going to try and like sync their contacts and calendars and mail and photos and everything all down to that one little phone. And then I went in to the storage settings and said, join the family account. And, and then it, that was fine. That's all it took. I will say this, and this will probably happen, although Apple might fix it when this all actually rolls out. Um, my, both my wife and my daughter were on separate storage plans because that's how you have to do it before iOS 11. And um, when, so when they moved to the family one, you know, it said, okay, well, you're, you know, we'll, we'll migrate you over and then we won't bill you anymore for your storage. But they still had, each had some time left, I don't know, 10 or 15 days or whatever in their monthly, um, you know, uh, section of the, of that plan. And uh, for both of them, when that was going to come back around, both them and I, because we're on the family plan together, got emails saying, hey, look, you know, you're using whatever 300 gigs of storage, um, tomorrow your plan's going to go down to five gigs and then you won't be able to add anything to it. And in a month it'll all be wiped out. Um, we ignored those emails and everything's been fine. Um, they're, they, they were and are part of this family's shared storage pool. It just was, you know, this weird thing in Apple's billing system is really all it was. And they, they weren't charged. And it's just now we pay nine ninety nine a month for two terabytes for the whole family. And life is blissful and, and cheaper, which is really the blissful part. So there you go. I think we got through that in about 12 minutes, John. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Any and thoughts maybe. on any of that? Yes, and maybe. No. Well, maybe one last thing. All right. No, no. Sounds like you're... <laughs> well, we're at 123. So, you know, we try to aim for 115. And so I'll share next squeezed. time. All right, there you go. Sure. I had some hard drive woes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We won't forget about those. All right, folks. Well... We told you about uh, how to contact us. We told you about the Facebook group. We told you how great you are for just being you. We told you how great you are if you can, in, in addition to being you, also support us on the premium level. We thanked everybody that did that this week. We thanked, uh, we told you about our sponsor. We thanked our sponsor. And that, of course, was Smile at SmileSoftware.com. And uh, we could we could tell you about Twitter, Dave, because it's a fountain of knowledge and wisdom. Sure. Um at least when it comes from us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
I am John F. Ron. He is Dave Hamilton. The podcast is Mac Geek Gab. The publication is Mac Observer. And there's that Pilot Peak guy all on Twitter if you want to tweet. Sounds like fun. I like uh, it's it, Twitter's actually uh, it's quite handy at times. It's a great way to be in touch with each other. So I like it. It's good stuff. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I want to thank our, our sponsor at uh, textexpander.com slash geek for this episode. Also, Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com and Barebones Software at barebones.com. I want to thank Cashfly at C-A-C-A-G-F-L-Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Really, I just want to thank all of you. I know we did that already, but that's kind of what I want to do. And thank you, John. Um, you know, since we're, we're in, in harmony here today, uh, I kind of want to let the advice be shared by everyone simultaneously, not just any one of us. So I think we'll do it like this. Don't get caught. Get caught. Get caught. Get caught. Made up.